Good morning. If you will, open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3, the third chapter of the book of Genesis. As you're turning there, I'd like to say Happy Father's Day to those who it applies and to those who just want to enjoy the day. I was informed earlier it is Father's Day for everyone, father or not, so Happy Father's Day to everyone. You think about fathers, and I can't help but think about my upbringing a little bit, and I did a lot of things that I take great pride in, and that was annoying members of my family, especially Big Sister. And part of that was annoying my dad, of course, and the, one of the most annoying things I think that my dad took away, this is my opinion, uh, from childhood, is the response that my sister and I would give any time an accusation was leveled. And it was, why did this happen, or how did this happen, or more specifically, who did this? You see, not being an only child, the easy answer was, not me. In fact, that was the answer all the time. In fact, Dad would preempt that response. He'd say, I want to know who did this, and don't say not me. In fact, it got so tough that he personified not me, and he said, not me causes a lot of trouble in this house. See, from an early age, we don't like to take responsibility for what we did. In fact, it's easiest just to shift blame. Now, there may, be, may have been many times where I was not guilty. I will stand by that party line. But there are times when we are guilty, and we don't like to take blame. In fact, it's really easy to find targets to blame. In fact, in this country, we do that all the time. Every time something happens, there is blame placed. On a serious note, you think about what happened just a week ago, and immediately, what did politicians on both sides of the aisle do? They blamed this group, this law, this speaker, this person, this candidate, that candidate, this Congress, this Congress. We blame. Rather than fixing an issue, I'm not proposing one, I'm just pointing out what happened. We blame. That's what we do. Something happens, we say, who's at fault? Sometimes take their job. In fact, we've become quite ruthless as a society, but when it comes to me, I'm not responsible. You see, when somebody else does something, I want them to step down. I want them to be fired. I want them to be punished for their misstatement, their misstep, their bad conduct. But when it comes to me, I'm not at fault because after all, the laws in this country allow me to do what I want. Or when I grew up a certain way, my parents just made me this way. It was always the way that it was. Or I was just born this way. The list of excuses go on and on. And what we mean when we give an excuse is, you can't tell me that. I'm not expected to do this. It is not my fault. And you see, that's the problem. The problem is when you examine the scriptures, that's not how God expects us to be. Whether you think about 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 10, when Paul lays a basic idea down, if anyone is unwilling to work, let him not eat. The point was, if you're unwilling to work, you're not supposed to be fed. It's not other people's problems if you will not take personal responsibility, if you are able to care for your needs. In fact, in 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8, that principle of self-providing goes even a little bit further where it's shown that a man should provide for his household. We should provide for our family members. The bottom line is, even in financial and just basic life ways, the Bible teaches we are to take personal responsibility for our actions, not pass the buck. But I think what you see in Genesis chapter 3 is that even from the beginning, even when man was in the garden with God, man had a problem taking personal responsibility. We look at me at Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. You know the story of the sin quite well, but let's read it. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. Or, excuse me, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves Loincloths. And you know what the modern day attorney would do with this story? When put on trial, Eve would say, it was not my fault the serpent enticed me. I was unable to choose. I was put in a moment of weakness. And if I am guilty, it should be a small commence sentence. You know what Adam would say. It's what Adam did say, which is, well, if you look at verse 6, Eve gave it to me. I am not the perpetrator here. 
It was given to me. In verse 8, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to me be with me. She gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. You see, in verses 1 through 7, we see the process of how Adam and Eve sinned. Yes, I am aware the character of the serpent was there. The serpent spoke to Eve. The serpent deceived Eve. And I'm aware that that is part of the story. But the bottom line is, from a human perspective, Adam and Eve sinned. The problem was, not only did they sin, but then they blamed each other. Do you see, what was, what was Adam's response? I love this one. Keep in mind, he's speaking to the Lord when in verse 11, or excuse me, verse 12, he says, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. We won't go into the <laughs> dynamic that is to say, this is the woman you gave me who gave me this fruit to eat, but suffice to say, Adam blamed Eve. And when it's Eve's turn to face the Lord, her response at the end of verse 13 is simply, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. And you see, frankly, that Adam and Eve are much like you and I, and that when push comes to shove, we are not to blame. It's not my fault. It's somebody else's. Adam can say, rightfully so, that Eve gave me, and I ate. And Eve could rightfully say, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. But no, what does God do? God punishes all, and he does so Justly. Do you see that in verse 14? By the way, we skipped over the serpent, but God did not. In verse 14, the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And of course, we come to the great verse 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And so the serpent was judged righteously by God. In verse 16, to the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. And the woman for her sin was judged righteously. In verse 17, and to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For you are dust. And to dust you shall return. And we know from the remainder of chapter 3 that man was cast out of the garden. And that they were guarded against coming back in. And that day man and woman were punished. Not because the serpent deceived them. And in Adam's case not because the woman gave him to eat. But because Eve sinned. Because Adam sinned. They did what God said not to do and they were punished for that and that alone. I think when I, when I concern myself with my life and I say, where do I fit into this? Sometimes when I do wrong, I like to look around and say, but somebody else does this. As if to say, if someone was more corrupt or wicked or depraved than I, then I should get off free. Well, that's, that's poor reasoning. Or even if I say, well, somebody else made me do it. Somebody did it with me. No. Who are we judged by? God. How does God judge? Justly. Righteously. And on the basis of me and my actions alone. I give an account for myself and how I serve God or how I choose to reject Him. Those are the options. Those are the lines. I am not held responsible for politicians, for elders, for any position that I am not in or expected to be from God. And that's both good news and terrifying news. I think Peter learned this lesson of God's just nature in Acts chapter 10. Will you look with me there? As Peter is having to deal with the consequences of God's true law, that Christ has opened the way for all to be saved, both Jew and Gentile, in the case of the convert of Cornelius. In Acts chapter 10 and verse 30, 34 and 35, Peter reaches the profound turning point in the scriptures in Acts chapter 10 that yes, the gospel is for all. But note the conclusion he reaches to get there. In verse 34, so Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right 
is acceptable to him. Do you see the line? He says in verse 34, yes, God shows no partiality. There it is in Scripture. But in every nation, those who fear him and does what is right is acceptable to him. The stakes are there. And the bottom line is clear. And excuses will not succeed in pardoning us from our rejection of God, whether we don't exalt him as the God that he is or we choose to not do what is right. I think the Bible is clear on personal responsibility. Perhaps the most clear example is in Genesis chapter 3 when man and woman sinned, they specifically tried to blame it on somebody else and we know God punished them according to their deeds. But I think this this idea goes a lot farther than just sin, although I would love nothing more than to talk about this concept and make sure that I myself and all of us understand I am responsible for me, but it does extend more broadly than that. I think what we'll see is we have responsibility for a lot of different aspects, and one of them is evangelism. I think a lot of times we try to excuse ourselves in several ways, and just like Adam and Eve, from the beginning we're making excuses and placing blame, common practices today. We see excuses that were made long ago in the Old Testament by none other than Moses. Will you look with me in Exodus chapter 3? In Exodus chapter 3, I think what we'll see is Moses reasons much like we do, And we're going to see God's response to him. What I love about the Old Testament narratives are we can see how people act and how we're still like them today. But what we also get to see is what God's response is in a direct fashion. Just like we did with Adam and Eve, now we can see how does God respond to the excuses of Moses. In Exodus chapter 3, we find ourselves with the Israelites in Egyptian bondage. And here Moses approaches God in the burning bush. And in verse 4, the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, called out to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings and I have come to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out to that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me and I have also seen the oppression which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come. I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And you see this great calling, and we know Moses goes through with it. We know that Moses ends up taking the people out of the land. But do you know how this conversation goes? God is speaking to Moses in a burning bush. Now try to, try to visualize that. That's hard for us. There is a bush on fire, not being entirely consumed at the moment. God is speaking to Moses. And he says in verse 10, Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses' response is, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? See, what Moses is saying is, I'm not your guy. I know, God, that this is your plan. He doesn't combat the plan with him. But he says, who am I? Should I really be the one to do this? And you see excuse number one. And what is God's response? Promptly in verse 12, we see, he said, but I will be with you. And this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you when you have brought the people out of Egypt. You shall serve God on this mountain. And Moses has an excuse. God has the answer. And now we're going to be on our way. Well, not quite yet. In verse 13, Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And you see the response from Moses here is, I don't know what to say. Now I know you want me to go lead your people out and to talk with Pharaoh, but I don't know why you're choosing me, first of all. God says, Well, I'm going to be with you. Okay, but I, I just don't know what to say. And by the way, this isn't too uncommon from us, is it? We can laugh at Moses speaking to God, but whether or not we're having a direct conversation with God that goes back and forth, when we reason this way, are we not facing the same doubts, the same conclusions that Moses reaches? And can we not take the same comfort that Moses did and that God had his answers, that God expects his plan to be carried out and will provide the way necessary? But note the response of God in verse 15. God also said to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. 
What is, what is Moses' excuse? He says, this isn't my responsibility because I don't know what to say. That's what his excuse was aimed to do, to excuse him from taking on this responsibility set forward to him by none other than God. And God's response to him saying, I don't know what to say, is here is what you say. We'll talk about that in a moment. And in Exodus chapter 4 and verse 1, Moses is not done trying to remove himself from the weight of this responsibility. He says, but behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say, the Lord did not appear to you. And you see, again, just another excuse of Moses. First he said, I'm not special enough, essentially. Then he says, what am I supposed to say? Now his response is, no one's going to believe me anyway, even if I do go. What is God's response? In verse 2, the Lord said to him, what is this in your hand? He said, a staff. And he said, throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground, and it became a serpent, and Moses ran from it. But the Lord said to Moses, put out your hand and catch it by the tail. So he put out his hand and caught it, and it became a staff in his hand that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. And then again, God gives him another sign. But again, Moses has given an excuse, and God has leveled it by saying, here is how you do it. Moses says, they will not believe me. God says, here is how you know they will. I am with you. But then Moses still isn't quite done. In verse 10, we see Moses tries another time. But Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. I don't know where you are in there, but I can look at, look at these four excuses and find myself somewhere. Moses starts by saying, who am I that you're going to send me? Then he says, well, I don't know what to say. And he says, well, even if I go and even if I know what to say, they're not going to believe me anyhow. And now what does he finally come to? I'm not good enough. I can't do it. I'm not talented enough. You know that. Who is the maker of Moses? The Lord. Who would know what Moses' capabilities are or are not? If God is a just God, and there are expectations for his creation, can we not reason that it is possible for us to do so? And if we find ourselves at odds with God's will, the problem lies with me, not with others, and certainly not with the Lord who gave the command. That's an important distinction to make when we say, how are we going to live? You contrast this with Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 8, when the Lord called for him and he says, here am I, send me. The Lord calls for Moses and Moses says, who am I? What am I supposed to say? No one's going to believe me and I am not the right guy because I simply don't have the talent. I am not eloquent of speech. But lest we forget, let's read the Lord's response in verse 11. The Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. But he said, Oh my Lord, please send someone else. We talked about that last Sunday. Send someone else. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is there not Aaron, your brother, the Levite? I know that he can speak well. Behold, he is coming out to meet you, and when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. You shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth, and will teach you both what to do. As God has answered each and every one of Moses' attempts to excuse himself from this responsibility. But can we not see that this is someone who is faced with a task, not the choice of sin or to hold God's law like Adam and Eve did, but a choice to serve God, to serve his purpose. What was God's purpose? To take his people out of Egyptian bondage. Who was the vehicle to go to Pharaoh? God chose Moses. Moses says, choose somebody else. Yes, those are excuses, but most importantly, the bottom line is Moses was unwilling to take the weight of the personal responsibility, whether he is completely genuine in each of these excuses or whether they are just simply thrown up there to make an argument. He was unwilling to take the steps to serve God. The question I have is, am I like that? Who am I like? Am I like Isaiah who says, here am I, send me? And then the mission statement he gets in Isaiah chapter 6 is they're not going to listen. They're not going to hear. They're not going to be able to see. Or am I like Moses, who's told by God, I will be with you. I will give you a sign. I will be with your mouth. And yet still, Lord, send somebody else. You see, the thing about individuals in the New Testament church is they were very much involved in spreading the gospel. We focus a lot, and rightfully so, on the apostles. Certainly the disciples of Christ were the witnesses to his great commission to go into all the world and to preach the gospel. 
But what about Acts chapter 8 and verse 4? If we want to be like the New Testament church, what does that mean for me? What does that mean for me who's not an apostle? What does it mean for me who is simply a Christian devoted to the will of God? In Acts chapter 8, I want you to notice what two groups of people there are. There are apostles and there are saints. Note where the apostles are and note where the saints are. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 1, And Saul approved of his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church and in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was, ra was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Who was scattered? The disciples except who at the end of verse 2? Except the apostles. You know what the number one way that we excuse ourselves from personal responsibility is, as we talked about last week, that someone else will do it, but there are more qualified people. There's a preacher here. There are elders here. There are deacons here. There are members more advanced in the faith. But where is our personal responsibility? Where is my desire to spread the word of God in this community at this time? Let me ask, what is your responsibility when it comes to evangelism? I ask that question, and there's probably dozens of different answers because we are dozens of different people made by God, but we share the one goal, to be in heaven with God. We share the one task, to be a light to as many people so that they may know God and glorify Him as well. What is your role? What is my role in evangelism in this community, for this congregation, right now, today? It may be that you feel that you're not qualified to teach. Maybe like Moses, you say, I don't know what to say. But what we can know from evangelism is there's a lot more to it than just being the one teaching. Do you think that when all the saints went about spreading the gospel, that, that none of the saints that they converted were helped by the teachings of Paul or Peter? Do you think when Paul and Peter found these new converts, they said, we don't need y'all. We, we, we know enough about the gospel already. No, there's always more to learn. There's more to do. There's time to grow, but we have to do our work. And the question is, what can I do to improve where I am now? Take responsibility today. What can I do? Answer in your mind. Can you invite people? Do you know someone who can teach a study? If you say someone else should do it, who is the somebody, and how can you connect them with that person? Can you host a study? Can you reach out to others? And if you aren't trained, if you don't know what to say, can you not study to learn? Can you not study the will of God to be able to teach others? Wherever you're at, make a goal today in your mind, right this minute, what can I do for the work of evangelism in the Orlando community? The way we excuse ourselves from this is we say, it's not for me. I'm not good enough. I can't do it. And so it wipes out of our mind and we go on doing the same thing we always do which is close to nothing. Brothers and sisters, we need to be personally invested in the will of God in this community. Wherever you are, be a light. Wherever you are serving, serve. What can you do for evangelism? Do it. Learn. Take on the task. Do it today. Take responsibility. If people in the world are lost in Orlando, it's the fault of each and every one of us for not at least exposing them to the gospel. God provides the increase. We answer to God on an individual basis, but certainly we are responsible for spreading the seed of truth. If people in the community have never heard about God, shame on each and every one of us here this morning, starting with myself. That should never be. With a church like this, with a group of Christians who are serving in this community, we could canvas neighborhoods, we could canvas offices if we just individually did our part. It's not about group efforts. It's not about some sort of church outreach program. It's about me as a Christian talking to who I know. It's about you as a Christian talking to you, who you know. We know different people. We all have got to do our part. This is how God intended his work to be. And when we're not like that, what does that mean for how I view God? And am I going to be personally responsible for the work here? Or will I say that it's the job of the elders? It's the job of Bumby, the congregation, to do evangelism, not me, not I. Let's be like Isaiah. What can I do to improve? Think about where you can serve and make two goals this morning on how you can improve. We're going to see that again. Take responsibility for helping others. 
I think when, you, when we read passages like 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 16, and let's turn there, please, we, we see an example of the church having a role. And I think the church is absolutely involved, to be involved with evangelism. It, of course, is to be involved in helping the needy saints. And in 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 16, that point is made clear. If any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her care for them. Let the church not be burdened so that it may care for those who are truly widows. There's two responsibilities there. Yes, the church must not be burdened. Why? So that it may care for those who are truly widows. The church has a lane, but I have a lane too. I am responsible for my family. I am responsible for who I can help. How many passages in the New Testament make clear individual obligation? Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10 makes it clear how broad the individual service goes. Do good unto all men, especially those of the household of faith. All men. It goes beyond just those of the household of faith, although the note is especially for them. Who are we to help? It's not the church's job to help everybody. So when we put in, when I put in a check into the collection plate, that's not my benevolence. Christ calls us to more than that. We have to know that. We have to practice that. And just like with evangelism goes more than teaching, benevolence goes more than just money. It's about serving. It's about looking. It's about finding. It's about taking advantage of the opportunities. You may not be a good cook. I am a terrible cook. But there's a lot of ways you can help somebody else. Maybe you can mow a yard. Maybe you can help move some furniture. There's a lot of things that each and every one of us can do that others aren't as well suited for. And so the best solution is not to sit down and do nothing and let two people do everything. It's to do what we can do. And again, when you think about hospitality in the New Testament church, it's by definition Christians taking in others. It is by very definition taking care of strangers, going out of perhaps our comfort zone and thinking of others rather than self. If I'm not helping them, if the community is not being served right, that comes back to me because I live here, because this is my work in serving Christ. And that applies to each of us, regardless of title or distinction in the church or out of it. And we need to be looking for opportunities to serve. Of course, the, the parable of the Good Samaritan is clear in Luke chapter 10. And what you saw is the Good Samaritan come upon a man who was beaten and left for dead. Then he stopped what he was doing and he tended to him in every way he could. That included money, that included care, that included looking out for his future provisions by finding someone to look out, out for him and over him. That's a distinct responsibility. And again, I have to ask, what can I do to improve? I want to think in our minds for a minute, what can I do to serve others? Is it hosting? Is it housing? Is it money? Is it moving furniture? Is it cooking? What is it? Whatever it is, think of two ways you can serve. And let's get started today. I think the bottom line is when it comes down to personal responsibility and Christians individually, we answer to God, but we are responsible no matter what we say. Do you see in Matthew chapter 27, look at this passage with me. I think this kind of sums up our efforts when we excuse ourselves from personal responsibility. When Jesus is before Pilate in Matthew chapter 27 and verse 24, Pilate was, was not a, an ignorant man. Now, I, we disagree, obviously, with his conclusion to allow Christ to be crucified. But note what Pilate says in Matthew chapter 27 and verse 24. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And of course, the Jews were right there to say, his blood be on all of us and on our children. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. When we excuse ourselves from evangelism for whatever the reason, or from serving others for whatever the reason, we are just like Pilate, who can give whatever reason he wants, but he is guilty because he could have made it stop, and he didn't. Pilate faced a riot, and the Jews were absolutely behaving in a horrendous way because they wanted Jesus dead, no matter the cost, including releasing Barabbas. But how silly does Pilate look saying, okay, I'm going to let you do this, but it's not my decision. It was absolutely Pilate's decision. Evangelism and serving others is absolutely my role. It's absolutely my life's service because Christ expects it to be. It doesn't matter what I say or how I reason out of it. It is my personal responsibility. And if I'm doing nothing, I am going to be held personally responsible for it. It doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't matter 
what role others play in deceiving us. You may say, well, I just didn't know better because for years I was taught this. Okay, but start now. Others may have mis mistaught. You may have been practicing wrong ideas of how to serve Christ. Maybe we need to change that today. We need to learn and read. It's not acceptable to go somewhere, hear false teaching and accept it just because someone is persuasive on it. Search the word. We can know what's true. God's delivered his word to us. We just need to read it. We need to study it. And that takes effort. But we're not going to be responsible for anyone but ourselves. But that means that I answer for myself regardless of what anybody else did. It goes both ways. Frankly, it doesn't matter how good Christians are around us. In 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10, we read about how Demas fell away because he was in love with the present world. Demas was in good company. In Colossians, Demas was named, and he was among good repute. He was with Paul. He was someone who knew Paul, at least. He was with good Christians, and yet he fell away. Do you think Demas would be saved when he deserted Paul, when he was in love with this present world? Not if that's where his story ended. That would be in violation of 1 John chapter 2. It didn't matter if you're around good people or bad people. I answer for me. We'll all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. The bottom line is, I need to take responsibility for my life. What will my answer be at judgment? Will it be, God, I have served you faithfully with all I can. Have mercy on me. Let me have the promise. Or will it be, oh God, I know what you promised. I know that you're merciful, but I, I just wasn't ready. Will we be like the, the, talent man, the one talent man in Matthew 25? I know you to be a harsh judge. No excuses will work. The bottom line is my answer at judgment will be, here is my life. Here are your expectations. Where do I stand to you, O God, who will judge righteously and justly? Just as he did with Adam and Eve, he will help us like he did with Moses, and we are responsible for our choices in every way. One big choice that we can each make is to choose to follow God. When you think about different declarations of faith, of course, Joshua chapter 24 stands at the heart of, uh, of many Christians and in our minds. But as for me and for my house, we will serve the Lord. The bottom line is I can serve the Lord or I can choose to reject Him. But today, I need to know that whatever choice I make, I am responsible. Brothers and sisters, we need to take personal responsibility for our service to Christ, but most importantly, in answering to God, have we done what you have requested? O oh, great God, have mercy on me, Heavenly Father. If you have never followed Christ, understand the only way to forgiveness of sins is being washed in His blood, having your sins washed away. Become a disciple today. You can do it. But maybe you've been a Christian. And maybe you allowed excuses, whether it be company or poor decision making or the cares of this world to, to make you fall away. Understand, we are all responsible for our choices, whether good or evil. But you can make things right today. Take personal responsibility today. Let's all serve in the kingdom with as much fervor and spirit as we can. Let's serve the Lord first. If we can help you in any way, come forward as we stand and sing the invitation song.